So what we're going to talk about is the idea of the perfections of grace. This is probably not a term you've ever heard before, and uh, uh, it comes out of a book by a guy named John Barclay, who is an influential um, British theologian who wrote this book in 2015. And uh, uh, it took me about three years to get through it, so because uh, it's just one of those books that when you read a little bit, you want to sit down and think about it a little bit before you go on. So, but uh, I think it has a lot to say to us. Why should we be discussing grace? Well, it's one of our key challenges in evangelism. Whenever you are talking to people here a lot, right, you, you start talking about well, what is the grace of God, and then you get into very interesting discussions because maybe that term has different meanings to different people and has different meanings to different theological contexts. Uh, I think being able to understand and apply grace to ourselves, it's essential for every Christian. I think it's even more important for people who are in vocational ministry because it's so easy for us to mix up our identities with our work and to get um, kind of confused. Um, uh, in, in a Roman Catholic context, being able to really be sure we understand what, and know what we mean when we speak about grace, I think is even more um, important. We'll, we'll talk a lot about that tomorrow. Um, and the last one, which is probably the reason this book got written in the first place, is that something called the new perspective on Paul has brought up a lot of conversation around kind of what exactly did Paul mean when he says a lot of the things that he says. And um, that conversation has been something we have done inside of Focus as well at times. And I think that um, this also sheds a lot of light on that, but again, more on that tomorrow. So we have three things for this morning, which is to understand grace and gifts in its cultural setting. Talk about that a little bit. Introduce this, these six perfections of grace that Barclay has, and then take a little bit of time to see how they show up in Galatians. The first thing is that grace and gift are very closely tied. So if you're wondering what grace is, if, if grace is a hard concept, think about gifts. In Greek, in Greek uh, a gift is charis, and a, no, a gift is charisma, and grace is charis. They are the same root word. They come from the same kind of thing, and the word charis even can mean both grace and gift in a setting in Greek. And here are definitions from the, the best Croatian <laughs> dictionary ever, Hrvatski jezični portal, and dictionary.com, which probably isn't the best English one. But anyway, so what do you, and you can shout anything you want to, what do you see up there, what leaps out to you when you look at definitions of grace, both in Croatian and English? So anything you, like, what do you see going on there? Yeah, so there is, I, I, I use some colors there. So there, there is the theological definitions with the dictionaries put last, which is that it is a undeserved gift, right? But Grace also has, or gift, grace has meaning in, in, uh, in the language outside of just a the theological context. And so how do, how do those normal sort of definitions of grace kind of make the picture more, maybe complicated? Ooh, Croatians are more holy. <laughs> <laughs> Croatians are more It's number four for us. It's yeah, for yeah, 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 <laughs> the, people, oh, yeah. The English yeah, they, they were, I even took out some of them out, because in English, there's a lot of use of the word grace about a person who's graceful, who, has, who moves well. That's a very, that's a very that, that, and that goes back to the Greek um, definition of grace as well. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's interesting that there's, there's three main things I think are going on here. One is that it is a kind of favor, and that's both a, a, a secular and theological meaning, is there's a kind of favor involved in, Greek, in, in, in the term grace. Uh, then there's this whole question of, is it pardon? Is it mercy? Is it, is it, uh, what is the relation between grace and mercy is another one that kind of we'll you know, need to explore a little bit. Uh, and then the last one is that it's, it's this idea of it being an un, uh, uh, unmerited, freely given gift, which comes more out of a theological context, and we will um, definitely look into that one. All right, so let's talk some cultural stuff here. Um, because uh, terms like grace, again, there was a Greek goddess of, named grace. So these are not concepts that were invented for the New Testament. So that, oh, so no one ever thought about grace before. So we're going to talk about grace in the New Testament. Grace was a cultural idea. And so it's, it's very good for us to both look into the cultural background of an idea and then look at how the, what the New Testament maybe assumed 
people could understand because of the cultural background, and then how the New Testament changed concepts as well. So it's good to look at the Greco-Roman context and our context and then try and figure out how that maybe informs how we think about this. I think a couple things about just, and again, we're talking about grace and gifts. So some stuff that's important to keep in mind, the Greco-Roman world was, by our standards, incredibly unequal. Very small number of people had control of almost everything. A huge percentage of the population was in slavery uh, or very, very poor. Yeah, so it, it, it feels familiar, and yet, and yet it's hard. It's so many steps more down that road than we can have ourselves experienced that it's, it's, it's pretty shocking. There was, they didn't have this efficient like, taxation system. They, they tried to take a lot of taxes, but there was no computers, so it was hard to tax people. Uh, and so it was uh, one of the big ways that things got funded in the ancient world was by benefactors. You would basically finally strong arm a rich person enough for them to do something uh, for the society. I think when we went to the, one of our staff conferences, we saw an aqueduct. And I think that aqueduct had a plaque or something you know, saying like which rich person coughed up the money to build this aqueduct because it wasn't built by just the general tax revenues of that year. So when a benefactor chose or agreed to or somehow was pushed to give a good gift to the people, then it was very, very important for the people to return that gift with thanks. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so, so there was this interaction between giving gifts as a superior and receiving thanks from those around you. Um, and, and there's, gifts were very, very complicated as they are today. So the Stoics said that a good giver should forget the gift that they have given the moment they give it, but the person who receives the gift never can forget. That's a Stoic teaching. Yeah, we're going to get to Croatia. Yeah, yeah. That is so cool. Exactly, yeah, yeah. I, I, knew, I knew this was going to be um, relevant. Yeah, yeah, we'll get to the creation. That's on the next slide, I think. So... Another interesting one is that when you gave gifts to your near peers, a peer or something like a two prestigious people, that created a cycle of giving and receiving. And the name for that cycle of giving and receiving in the Greek world was friendship. That's what the word friendship really comes from, is that peers in a cycle of giving and receiving where you know you can rely on each other, that's friendship. And I also have like a... Like out giving and out receiving or... or no, like, like yeah, a cycle. Yeah, yeah, between you, because like... Pro- in our culture, it escalates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's no longer French. Yeah, we'll get to that. All right, so as, as I think your comments are alluding to, there's a difficulty, which is that gifts create instability. Gifts are, are uh, they're complex and they're destabilizing. And this is funny too. So Greek officials in cities, because they, was, they were building a culture of having you know, like laws and a, regu- a regulatory system and stuff, one of the problems they ran into is that there was, there was this cycle of giving and receiving amongst their officials, which was that if, if I give you this position, you give me a gift. And then they realized, they created the idea that really, oh, this is actually a bribe and bribes are bad. So the Greeks themselves in the city, in the era of their city states, tried to get their officials to stop accepting these reciprocal gifts because they were starting to understand how corrupting they were. So this is a 2,500 year old problem, (laughs) Uh, not from yesterday. Another interesting one is that in their mindset, the difference between a wage and a gift wasn't necessarily about whether money was exchanged uh, for labor. It was about whether a, a relationship, an enduring relationship was set up. So when you, when you go to the market one time and buy you know, one apple from somebody you're never going to see again, that's, that's, just an, that's just wage exchange. But when you, when you are in relationship with a person, then it's different, which I think also sets off some cultural things because it's you know, with your my store or whatever, it's like, hey, this is not just, you know, you're not just paying me money here. This is like a relation. So anyway, okay, so um, another one, this very, very interesting part that he points out in this book. The ideal that gifts come with no strings attached, and I asked Sandra last night, she couldn't think of a good creation term for no strings attached. Um, uh, There's always strings. <laughs> 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 like, but, but no strings is like a nice, like, you know, phrase. I like that. 
So um, the idea of the disinterested gift is from French philosophy from only the past couple hundred years. It kind of goes through Kant to, to French philosophers. The word altruism you know, is a word that's like only 150 years old. And so no one in culture ever sort of idealized the idea that you give with like no thought to return until very, very recently, and it was done by French philosophers, which is always interesting because amongst evangelical Christians, we usually don't go yay, yay for ideas that French philosophers came up <laughs> 150 years ago. Um, and the Reformation is partly responsible for this, probably. You could probably argue this like all day long, but it seems that Luther uh, definitely, I mean, not, not it seems that Luther definitely taught the ideal of God giving this no strings attached gift to humanity. But what Luther was very clear on is that he saw, what he wanted to see changed was instead of people investing so much of their time trying to return to God for the, the gracious gift, he felt like that enables you to, to love your neighbor. So God has loved you, which you then turn around and use to give non, God has given you a non, no strings attached gift, which you then use to give no, no strings attached gifts to your neighbors. Um, and, but it is interesting that in the West, we have come to idealize somehow the idea of the no-strings-attached gift, um, anonymous, unreciprocated, disinterested gifts. That's become an ideal for us. But we are still aware of how powerful and coercive gifts are. Maybe the ideal has changed, but I don't know how much the reality has changed. Uh, many, a bunch of people in this room are going to do ministry partner development training on Monday and Tuesday, and we are going to tell you how important it is that you thank your donors. Thank you notes must be written promptly upon receipt of gifts. <laughs> so we are, <laughs> we are not, <laughs> we, you know, so it's even in America or whatever, that is still a very um, important thing. So thank you notes show that the West still believes in reciprocity in a sense. Okay. All right. Let's talk about Croatia. All right. Reciprocity in relationships is still very normal, right? So uh, I don't know if the, the girls, I think you've all been here before, so you know that one person always pays for coffee in the cafe. You do not split your 20 kuna bill two ways. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, uh, oh, yes, it's dying. Off. It's dying. Okay, maybe, but this is this is a uh, uh, powerful. You're hanging out with the wrong. Yeah, you're hanging out with the wrong. So. One of my favorite stories about getting, getting used to life in Croatia is that we'd been here for a couple of years and we went out with good friends of ours, one of the first couples that we started to get to know kind of together as a family. They took us to um, Shestinsky Lag, Lagvich, you know, so it's like a nice restaurant and, and we were there for a long time. And, and more, more and more food was ordered and we were hanging, and I started to think about how much money I had in my pocket. And I started to think about guessing what half what the bill was. Did you invite them? Or did they, they, invite they invited, you? yes, they invited us. Okay. Well, no, but see, I was new here, right? Yeah. So, was that with you? Uh, you, you don't remember this? Okay, I will, you're in the story. So, uh, uh, <laughs> so, so what happens is, as, as this is going on, and I'm knowing, okay, we're close to the end here. How am I going to bring this up? How much money, do I have enough money to even pay half of this, like with me? Uh, it was probably seven or 800, I don't know, maybe it was 600, 700 kuna or something like that. And then um, when I finally said like, oh, well, um, yeah, well, what about, you know, the bill or whatever? He said, oh, I took care of it. He had done the classic creation move of going to the bathroom <laughs> and, paying, and paying the bill. And I think my face like went white. I was like... I can't believe this. Like, I don't think in my life anybody had ever paid, you know, friends dinner fifty, sixty dollars, something like that, and just paid it, right? So, so we get in the car and we're going home, and I was like, Sandra, what just happened? And she said, Oh, well, now we're friends. And I was like, Oh, that's what happened. So she said, We'll pay the next time. This is this is how you know your friends. So she was happy, and I was, you know, paralyzed, kind of like. Yeah. So there is much more of that still in Croatia today than there is in the West. <laughs> yeah. But so you see, like the Greeks, the idea of alternating payment is a way of solidifying friendship. So power, you know, prosperous people in Greece would, would I, I do a big thing for you, you do, do a big thing for me. The knowledge that the, the sort of the reciprocation cycle is going to continue is a way of solidifying friendship. And we still have that today. 
What? Manus manum lavat. What does that mean? Oh, hands, hands. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. Okay. You scratch. We. And. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and we because we yeah so it's not like it's dead in America either. Um, the powerful still act as benefactors today. One of my favorite moments was when the financial crisis hit, and my kids were still in Vertich, the last financial crisis. The next one is now coming. But the last financial crisis, 2009, do you remember budgets being cut like crazy? There was the Harach tax. There's, you know, all these things are happening. And all of a sudden, they were talking about how they were gonna, what they were going to do with the kindergarten system. And so instead of paying your standard 400 kuna a month for kindergarten in Zagreb, which is like nothing, right? They were going to have this sliding scale, and you had to declare your income, and it was going to go up to 2,000 kuna. And it was causing you know, just all of this talk in the city of Zagreb. And I remember driving in the car and hearing a press conference with Milan Bandic, the, the mayor, and he said, Dali smo dok smo imali. You know, now it's getting harder. We, we gave while we had money, and now it's getting harder. And my American, I'm a taxpayer mind went, it's not your money. You know, you didn't give while you had. Like, where does the money come from? It's our money. It's, you are just the, <laughs> you are just the steward of all of our money. <laughs> but... But, but that was so funny, because, and, and that's how politicians, I mean, still today, right, it's like the, the, when the elections are, are coming up, I'm sorry, <laughs> when the elections are coming up, um, all of a sudden a bunch of playgrounds get fixed, a bunch of schools get something fixed, right, and then you're like, well, the road work happens, and, and kind of at the last minute you're like, I need to return some honor to this guy because he, you know, he made some, he, he fixed some stuff up, right? So we have this, we still act in this way in a lot of ways today in Croatia. All right. So another one in Croatia, the, the, the person who receives something thanks. And I mean, do you ever think about, I mean, tell me whether you agree, think this applies or not, but it's interesting. So the word hvala, thank you, is related to terms for praise or honor, right? So... Because khvalisati is, you know, the, the, the root term is similar, right? So when you say khvala, a way you could translate that is sort of like saying praise to someone who has, when you say thank you, right? This is also in Greek, the term for thank you in Greek is eukarisma. So you also praise, you give good praise back to a person, which is where eucharist comes from, thank you uh, in, Greece, in Greek, and it means kind of good, um, uh, a good gift, I'm recognizing that this is a good gift. But like the Stoics in Croatia, and then when someone thanks you, your ideal response is to say, Nema na chemu, which means it was nothing. Even if it was, even if it was 4,000 kuna for your kum's uh, uh, you know, wedding, and you just took out a loan on 12 months on installments to buy them their washing machine, you say, Nema na chemu. It was nothing, right? So. <laughs> did, did they say it too? How does it? Hey, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Don't mention it. Yeah, so we we do we do two things in English. You can say don't mention it, or it was nothing. But it's also when you say you're welcome. Maybe that's a little bit different. Like you are you are welcome to this. So it's yeah. We also can say molly. Yeah. Molly. Yeah. So uh, uh, anyway, all that to say. Gifts in ancient Rome, in today, they are powerful, they're complex, they create, unsp they, they involve often unspoken expectations. Um, just because something isn't said doesn't mean it's not important, right? So all, all this introduction was to, to kind of get us thinking about, yeah, wow, gifts are a real thing. We all have lots of thoughts about them. And these things are going to affect the way that we think about God's grace as well. Because there's almost nothing that we understand about God that's just purely theoretical. There's a, this is a big theological term, but you know, God always condescends to explain himself to us in ways that are understandable to us in the cultural setting in which we live. He condescended to use the Greek and Hebrew languages and people in their time and setting to make the gospel known. So he, we are, he's always working with our messed up, confused concepts that we have in our heads, and he's pushing those things, and he is transforming us through them, but he's always also ready to work with them. So 
at the very least, we should be very cognizant and aware of all of the internal ideas in our heads that go into what we think about gifts, giving, receiving, what a good giver is like, what a good receiver of a gift is like. And that's what, that'll help us in our discussion as we move forward. So here are some questions that I think show these, these uh, we could argue about a lot of these, I think. You know, should gifts be freely given to those who ask, or should they be given somewhat selectively? Is a good giver like really like just sprays gifts all over the place, or does a good giver give really specific thoughtful gifts? Um, is a good person only generous, like generosity is their thing, or are there occasions for withholding or cutting off generosity in a relationship? Ooh, I think, yeah, so, right? Um, should gifts be given like broadly to create new relationships or cautiously to those you're sure will respond? Yes. <laughs> should, should gifts be given only to those who have deserved them or also to those who do not deserve them at all, right? Well, that's interesting, right? Do, do gifts succeed in cementing and creating and like strengthening relationships or do they often fail? Um, do, do gifts, can, can gifts, do gifts change their recipients? That's an interesting question. Um, and should gifts be given to those who can uh, and will properly acknowledge them and reciprocate them? Or is it okay to give somebody a gift to someone who can never reciprocate? So those are all like, those all have relevant cultural meanings and questions. Those are all things we could talk about in terms of how you give gifts to friends on their birthdays and stuff. But each one of these also has implications about how you think about God's grace and gifts to us. So that, that's the first big thing is to kind of connect that this is all like really tied in here. We all have lots of cult. You have your family picture about how gifts were given. You have a cultural picture about gifts. And that plays into your understanding of the gifts of God, of God's grace. Anybody have a comment or something? So the question, I think, is, is a really good question, which is, like, should we then, like, always be adapting to the culture? Because in Croatia, you can move 10 kilometers, and it seems like a different culture. Um, or should we, you know, really focus on what the Bible says? I hope what this is going to give you is a way of realizing um, we are not here to cater to the culture. But if we don't understand it, we will not preach to the gospel to it well. Because I think the, what, what we see in the Bible is the Bible is an incredibly culturally embedded uh, revelation. So it's not like the, the Quran, theoretically, for a Muslim, is something that fell from heaven and was dictated to, to a guy who had no idea what he was writing down. And that's how the um, Mormons also think about like the, the Book of Mormon and stuff. The, the, as Christians, we believe in God inspiring the authors in specific settings. And so all of Paul's letters are, are written because something's going on. So that's an interesting pointer to us as, as, as Christians that when we do theology, we do it in conversation with our, with our cultural setting, trying to figure out. And you see Paul like, Try, I, I think it's one of the things we'll see today. Paul both makes use of what they already understand and is, and is leaning on his under, that, that they're going to get certain things because of their culture, and he pushes really hard against their culture in certain places. And so that's always our call as missionaries is to try to be figuring out, like, where is the culture? And so what is it that I can use in the culture as I appeal to people? And what is it that I need to really push and say, this you have totally wrong? So oh, let's, like, cool. You'll see how, whether you think this works or not as we go on. Okay, so what are these six perfections of grace? Um, he described, Barclay uses this term perfections. What do you, yeah? I wanted to ask, what, what's a perfection? Yeah, so a perfection, <laughs> a perfection is the idea, great question, great question. It's an aspect of grace that gets, that gets pushed to its logical conclusion. You know how like sometimes people in arguments say, like, well, if you take that to its logical conclusion, then blah. So this is, this is like, yeah, let's take it to its logical conclusion. But what if you push on a concept? You don't just say there's some of this. You say, I'm taking this all the way, as far as I can. I'm going to perfect this concept. And so he, he uh, examines you know, the grace. Kainos, yeah. Um, uh, they're both cultural and theological concepts, so you can, you can think about these perfections of grace both culturally and theologically. The Bible addresses all six of these. You'll see the fun is to think about which ones you think are truly the gospel or not. Um, it is not necessarily more gracious to believe in more of them. So it's not like, oh, three out of six, you're halfway there, six out of six is true grace. 
uh, you will see that you're like, eh, I don't know about that one. So they're, they're, they, um, uh, very few people actually would try to picture all six of them perfected at the same time. And they are, each one is distinct, but they interact with each other. So, uh, and, um, yeah. Okay, so the first one is superabundance, which I think pre obilnost is probably pretty close to that. Um, and this is just the, the, the scale and abundance of grace, that there's so much grace. Uh, uh, this is common to almost all Christian definitions of grace, that it is superabundant. And you can even find some non-biblical sources that say similar things. So here's a, I won't read the whole one, but from Seneca, he says, see what great things the gods do every day, how much they divide amongst us, with how great crops they fill the earth, how they move the seas with convenient winds to carry us to all shores. That, that, that. Okay. Can you think of a Bible verse that talks about the just super abundant grace of God? Just, there's just so much grace that God gives to the his people or to the earth. I forget where it is, but it's grace upon grace. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's in Corinthians. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he gives grace upon grace. Yeah. See what grace the Father has lavished on us that we are called his children. Lavished, yeah. God has lavished grace on us. Yeah, there's a lot of this kind of language in the Bible. One that I um, uh, uh, thought of was Romans 5.15, where he says, The gift is not like the trespass, for if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? So Paul uses a lot of those terms like overflowing. Um, almost everybody perfects this. Almost everybody says, of course, like the extent of God's grace is just amazing. So there's, there's, and I have the same kind of questions for each one of these. So the, the danger of it is very little, but maybe the kind of trick with it is that just because somebody says God is incredibly gracious doesn't mean that you understand what kind of grace they're talking about, right? Because it's very, very common in biblical definitions of grace to say there's so much of it. And it's like, wow, that's great but I'm not sure, I need to know more to know what exactly you're really talking about. Okay, the second one is called singularity. This, this is one of the, his harder terms. Um, uh, let me just say what he, he means by this. That the giver's exclusive mode is benevolence. Um, grace in this perfection, if you really push this to its end, you're saying God is so gracious that his, he is only gracious. He, he basically divine judgment and stuff like that kind of goes away. God is, God's grace is, is grace because he does nothing else but be gracious. Um, an example from a non-biblical source, and one of the things that uh, I've definitely been learning is that the, the Apocrypha uh, and the other books that didn't even make it to the Apocrypha are really, really interesting for us to read. I know it's like as good evangelicals, it was like, yeah, that's the part that didn't make it into the Bible, so like, let's not go there or whatever. It's actually really helpful to read because those are the best documents that help us understand what Jews thought around the time that Jesus lived. Because one of the key questions we're going to get into is, what is Paul fighting with? Like when Paul is fighting against Judaizers in Galatia, what did those people think? And the best clues we have as to what those people thought were the kind of documents that were actually being written at the time. Because the Old Testament is written when they still had a temple 400 years before, and then rabbinic literature, which has become quite a hot topic amongst a lot of Christians, is relevant, but all rabbinic literature is basically written after the fall of the temple, which radically changed Jewish thought and practice. So it's, it's documents like this, Wisdom of Solomon, which was probably written, I think, in like the 100 years before Christ or something, that tells you a lot about kind of more what people were thinking around the time of Jesus. So here's a quote from, and this is in the Apocrypha. It's, it's, I think it's also called Ecclesiasticus and in different, it gets several different names. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, if you buy the normal Catholic Bible, you would have this, and you can read it. And, and it's interesting to read and think like, okay, what sounds super similar in, to me? And like, where are some places I think like this is a little bit different? So here's what Wisdom of Solomon says. You are merciful to all, for you can do all things, and you overlook people's sins so that they may repent. For you love all things that exist and detest none of the things that you have made, for you would not have made anything if you had hated it. Okay. Now, I, I know what you probably think about this one, but do, can you think about some Bible verses that maybe don't perfect this, but kind of talk about this kind of thing? The kindness of the Lord causes us to repent. Yeah. Yeah. 
a couple of, um, uh, like Psalm 145, 9, it says, the Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. Uh, kind of is in that direction. And another one that's pretty interesting is Romans eleven thirty two, 32, uh, which is probably slightly, um, anyway, no, I won't say it. For God has bound, over, has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. So that's kind of in this direction. But what about, isn't it first, first Peter who said, like, God's desire is for everybody? To yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, yeah, exactly. So who, who perfects grace is singular. Marcion, who was a heretic. That might be a clue. Um, modern liberal Protestant, <laughs> which often, you know, there's no judgment. God just loves. That's all God does. Um, and actually, some aspects of Vatican II and later Roman Catholic teaching has been more and more leaning in this direction. When, the, when there's a more and more talk about how there's a grace that God gives to Catholics, there's then another kind of grace that God gives to anyone who believes in God or to other kinds of Christians than anyone who believes in God. And there's even a kind of grace that's just given, even if you're an atheist, that you have received some kind of a grace as part of humanity. So there's, there's a way in which it's pushing to say that grace is kind of with everybody as a common grace. Yeah. So, and the danger of overemphasizing this is, does, does this then remove justice completely? Has justice kind of disappeared if there is no, if God is only gracious? So the third one is called priority. I think singularity and priority are two terms he chose that are a little bit challenging. Priority means not like, like priority mail, but like prior. He means by this that something happened before something. Um, prior in time to any initiative on the part of the recipient. That grace is prior. Um, an example from a non-biblical source is uh, another person who's interesting to read is Philo. Did you use I don't know. It's like I tried hard, but yeah. tell me what I did wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, what would you say for something that you know? You uh huh yeah. So you can say like anticipation. So I thought prevenstvo. I looked at prevenstvo, and then I thought maybe that was. Okay. okay yeah. You got to be proud. You got to be proud of me for trying. Anyway, so uh, Philo, Philo said something about this. He says God. Philo was really into this because Philo was trying to reconcile Judaism and Greek philosophy. So he says God anticipates the intention of the man who, in a genuine and sincere spirit of piety and truth, hastens to do him service. God sees it ahead of time, and so he, he grants grace to that person before they've done it, but, he's, but he kind of knows that the person's going to do it. So uh, a Bible verse, can you think of one that talks about God's grace being prior to any action on their... Okay, that one I'm saving for the next one. Okay. But no, that is interesting, yeah. How about Luke 15 where the father's waiting for him to come to the senses? He's watching. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. We're going to talk about the prodigal son, too. Ephesians 1. Ephesians 2. What? He prepares, yeah, he prepares, yeah. He prepared things for us ahead of time. Uh, like, there's a lot of verses about this kind of stuff, right? So Romans 8.29, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. So this is definitely one you have to think about how this works in the Bible. Uh, a lot of, and the, one of the really important points is this was a very common way for Jews to think about God's grace in the time of the New Testament. They believed that God was graceful and they believed that he showed prior grace to his people, to the Jews. And then later you have someone like Calvin who really perfects this and talks about, you know, the importance of God's choice of us before we do anything. Uh, a danger of overemphasizing it would be that it, the way Calvin did it is that it seems to eliminate human freedom. It's kind of like, okay, what, you know, where, where did this really go? Um, priority, you're, you'll see this more tomorrow. The interaction between priority and the next one is one of the places where I think we have a lot of work to do in helping people understand biblical grace. So think about this one and, and kind of like try to park this in your head and try and compare it to the next one because that's where I think some of the real action is. The fourth one is incongruity. Uh, and I had a sermon on this at church, so I, I think that I got, the, the, I got official um, amen from people on the translation that ne primieronost is a good word for this. 
Ok. Yeah, yeah. Well, but maybe. Yeah, that, that, okay. So, uh, incongruity means without regard to any worth on the part of the recipient or against the worth of, against the lack of worth of a recipient. But that's interesting, yeah. Yeah, neosclogenous, okay. So an example from, there are not all that many examples of this in non-biblical sources, but one would be the very interesting um, uh, uh, sect at Qumran that left us the Dead Sea Scrolls and had all sorts of very interesting, their own little teachings on stuff. They had this kind of like, they're one of the few Jewish groups that had this, we're so terrible, um, way of looking at things. So uh, here's a quote from them. As for me, from dust you took me and from clay I was shaped as a source of pollution and shameful dishonor, a heap of dust and a thing kneaded with water, a council of maggots, a dwelling of darkness. So that is, <coughs> that is one kind of incongruous way of looking at, at grace. Can you think of a Bible verse you get was mentioned before? Yes, yes. Can you say it again? <coughs> Yes, so this one seems to really like come out strongly in Romans 5, 6 through 8. You see, at the right time, while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. That's maybe priority. But then he goes on to say, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. Don't get confused about those two things. He's basically saying, maybe you would die for a good person. But this is the kicker in 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, Why we were still sinners... Christ died for us. While we were God's enemies, Christ died for us. That is a kind of grace that, um, a perfection of grace that was very, very rare until um, uh, early Christianity, very, very rare uh, kind of outside of Paul's preaching of the gospel. Uh, and so that's one we'll, we'll definitely be coming back to. The fifth one is efficacy, uh, that it, it achieves what it sets out to do. I couldn't find a good example of this. I know there are some, but I just couldn't find a good quote for it. Again, Calvin uh, perfects this with the idea of the, uh, we were, you know, I guess the, it wasn't Calvin himself who, who created the term perseverance of the saints, or did he? I don't know. Um, but that, so the, the idea that grace is grace because it, it, it achieves what it sets out to do uh, is, is, the, um, is efficacy. And a Bible verse for that. Philippians 1.6, that's the one I have. Uh, being confident in this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So a strong view of the, that God, the, the grace of God is um, uh, a sort of a force that pushes us towards what God wants it to accomplish. That would be eff efficacy. And the last one, which I think goes back a lot, the cultural kind of conversation we had, is non-circularity, um, which... I had two things there. I don't know how they sound. Neprovatnost or neokruznost? Neprovatnost. Okay. Uh, this means no return to the giver. Uh, it frees the recipient of responsibility. That grace is grace because God expects nothing in return from you. That's what really makes grace grace. That would be that perfection. Um, Bible doesn't... Yeah. Yeah, that's the question, right? So, <clears throat> um, yeah, is, is there a Bible verse that says this, that God gives his grace in Christ and kind of asks, asks nothing in return? Or a place where the Bible talks about this kind of thought? He asks everything in return. Yeah, so this one's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> but a did I yeah <laughs> but something that what? yeah we Psalm 103 which we are but dust yeah yeah so that's yeah so um, one that that seems to now okay, how to put this a verse that is addressing the possibility of thinking this way I think is is like Romans 6 1 and there's another verse where Paul asks these rhetorical questions about thinking that what people think about his view and says what shall we say then shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase and then he says may it never be but he's at least addressing the thought that says oh 
God like just gives more grace every time I sin. So when I sin, I'm like increasing grace. So grace abounds. So that's a kind of a way of thinking about non-circularity, like that, that grace would be grace if it's just like piled up on top of itself the more, you know, and expects nothing of you in return. But it's the, pro it's the last principle is it's, it's efficient. It actually, that's his argument, but it changes us. So that's yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, the, again, the main, the main point in this, like what really shot, what really blew me away reading this book is that I had never seen anybody kind of break it down like this before into these categories. And I hope that this just some of these, I mean, the terms maybe find simpler terms for them that he used, but that this would become a way, a part of our vocabulary when we talk about grace with one another to know like, oh yeah, so to have more precise um, discussions about it. Um, and a definite, uh, so Luther and Calvin both pushed a little bit towards this, um, uh, again, by saying that the return to God is not in doing anything for him or to him, but to, to love your neighbor. They were both extremely concerned about what they saw as this kind of medieval way of, of that God, all of God's gifts come with major strings attached and you have to return them to God or you're, you haven't really received them properly. And so they were concerned about that. And you can see on, in the way Western culture went from there that you do end up eventually with this kind of, you have Kant, who was influenced by the Reformation, eventually saying that the proper gift is one in which you think nothing of the return. So gifts are powerful, gifts are complicated. You have to you know, keep your eye on kind of how you look at your view of grace because it may do things to you you didn't expect. These are all kind of forces that are, that are going on here. And, and of course, a danger of this one is that it turns into fire insurance. It's the, you know, the, the, you know, the joke, the, you know, like our gospel is just fire insurance to save you from the fires of hell. Like, we just go around and say, well, you prayed to see Christ, and so now you're forgiven, and I have nothing I more mean, to say to you. I the church found ways to monetize it, too. Yeah, yeah. So Ouch. this is a summary of this, and so I, you know, to help you keep score or whatever, I printed out um, these. So take one. That's the same thing that's on the screen. So anybody, any comments or, like, at this point... Uh, no, no, no. So wait, no. He, no. He's saying that that. Um, well, actually, he does. Um, he doesn't have a biblical example in saying the Bible teaches non-circularity, but he's he. It seems very clear that early on in the New Testament churches, you know, Paul is being accused of some kind of license, license like a gospel that creates license, yeah. right? And so Paul is responding to critics at certain points, and so. This obviously is some kind of a thing that's in, like, even though culturally this is a very odd way of thinking in the ancient world, there's obviously something about the gift of Christ that leads people to wonder if that means they can do whatever they want to with no, like, change in their lives. And so Paul seems to feel like he needs to respond to a view like that. Yeah, it's Romans, you know, Romans in Romans, five, yeah. Romans five, you know, Romans yeah, so he, when he has the, the rhetorical questions he asks and the answers and stuff like that. But I, I mean, Then that's like so uh, wrong unjust and wrong. wrong and yeah. Unfair. yeah. Unfair. Well, I think the two of these that I think are most relevant for us in our evangelism are incongruity, but not, you know, emphasizing incongruity with, and, and making sure to explain to people we are not emphasizing non-circularity. So in, in, in congruity, what we're saying is not only did God show grace to you and all this kind of stuff, but he found nothing in you worthy of his gift. And, and there continues to be nothing in you worthy of his gift, even as you grow as a Christian. You do not become worthy of the gift. Yeah. Which, that gets into the discussion with Catholics, so we'll talk about that tomorrow. Um, uh, but, but, non but, because, but then people, when we explain that kind of grace, like you said, it's very, very normal in Christians go like, eh, so you're telling me I can pray to receive Christ, be forgiven of all my sins now and forever for the rest of my life, and I can go out and murder someone, and I'm still going to heaven. And then we go like, well, yeah, you know, we say, no. We have our spiel. We have a spiel, right? We, yeah. If you're like that, you never really understood. Yeah, if you're like that, you never understood, right? Whereas I think what's going on. There's the efficacy, too. You get it, but you don't get it. Yeah. Yeah. 
truly of that and you confess your sin. Yeah, yeah. Well, but I, and I think one of the things that, one of the reasons I brought up like the creation culture and stuff is that I think one of the things that we, well, okay, like last year we talked about some aspects of like an honor and shame culture and some things that, you know, that Croatia still is a culture very informed by honor. And I think in a Croatia that where honor and shame still really matter, it is very appropriate for us because I, we'll talk about this tomorrow too, that Paul leaned into their intuitive understanding that the only honorable response to a great gift is to act appropriately in return, that I think then we should, you know, then you can talk to people out of that as well and say like, well, if God gave you this incredible gift, would you not just feel like the proper response to this is at least to show him thankfulness and to act appropriately and to respond well? Because that's a very, very strong value for all of us, isn't it? You know, kind of a thing as a way of saying, and basically I think Paul in Romans 6 through 8 is relying upon their cultural understanding of circularity. He seems to be just relying on the fact that like, if I press home on this hard enough, you're going to go, oh, wow, yeah, I don't want to be a jerk. Only a jerk would get a gift like this and kind of walk away from it. That's why I should really be motivated. Um, so, but there's a lot to this. And again, it took me like three years to figure my way through this. So this is just the start of a conversation. Okay, so real quickly, let me just show you a couple passages from Galatians and we'll have, we'll have discussion. So. These are, like, I, well, I was thinking, I, I woke up at 4.30 in the morning, I couldn't sleep, and then I was thinking about, these perfections are really interesting, you can play with them, you can use them, so I was thinking to myself, like, which perfections of grace does Santa Claus have? And so, you know, you can, like, you can do this with many, many different things. So, but it helps you, both when reading, I think, the Bible, to go, oh, what kind of grace is being perfected here? Also, tomorrow, I want to show you a couple of texts from... Um, contemporary religion kind of things that so you can also look and say, what, what kind of, like, which perfections of grace are being emphasized here? So, like I'd say in the, um, uh, in Galatians 1, in his greeting, when he says, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of God our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Um, there's definitely the superabundance that Paul uses a grace so much in his greetings and stuff. Paul is always speaking about this amazing uh, uh, quantity of the grace of God. But I think he also mentions incongruity and priority here in saying, basically, you know, think about this, like, what did we do? He gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of God and of our God and Father. What did we do in that? Or what, what made us worthy or ready for that? There's no reference to it. It just says, God did this thing to rescue us, right? So, I should, yeah. Okay, I'm trying to wrap my head around a little bit. Where, where does it kind of fit in, like, okay, so he, he gets grace, and it's ultimately to his glory. So, like, where does that fit in, like, okay, we translate it, we give gifts or we give grace to someone, but it's a reflection on us. Like, it reflects back to us. That makes sense. Are you talking about when we, then what are our gifts to other people like? Or what, what, It brings glory to us in a sense. Like, I, like where does it fit in? Like he's, he's getting his grace without connection, and yet it creates a glory or an honor for him. For him, yeah. Sense. Yeah. I'm sorry. I mean, where I'm it fits in like this, because it seems like all this grace we're talking about is like non, you know, non-connected, non-strings, non da da Well, no. Yeah, the question is, is it really no yeah. strings attached, yeah. right? And, and this, uh, I think one of the reasons to bring up the culture stuff is that it's, it's, it was quite striking to me to realize only French philosophers perfected the idea that no you're not supposed yeah. to, like, no strings attached. And that makes me go, oh, you know, we, I think as Americans, we would tend to think, yeah, grace is great, you know, if you just don't have to do anything. And there are, I mean, Anna, I remember, like, we had discussions about, you were involved some with the ministry or... There was this ministry that was in Croatia for a while, like a grace ministry something or other... And like, uh, and I remember one time you brought up and you said like, I was at one of their seminars and they said, um, they taught that grace means you never ask God for forgiveness. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and she was like, and then Anna remembered like, well, in the Lord's prayer, we basically like, <laughs> we like you know, and, and I was like, oh, wow, that's a really good point. So there are, there are these Christian views that get like really, really extreme and I think perfect Five, like a whole, whole bunch of these. And the question is, which one is really, like, where's the Bible really, you know, pushing on? And the funny thing for me in this was realizing, aha, uh -huh, the Bible doesn't seem to prevent, to perfect non-circularity. And then the question of how that works in our relationships with other people is a very interesting 
next part of the conversation, right? So how do we, like when we, yeah, I don't think that it means, oh, because God is actually looking for us to praise him in the gifts that he gives us, that means that when we give gifts to other people, like they should reflect glory back to us or something. Like, uh, but the, again, like this is more like a roadmap, I think, to lay things out, to give you something to really, you know, chew on because this is the topic we think about all the time. And I hope that putting some new like labels on it and breaking it down a little bit differently will give you a lot to, to talk about. Um, since I'm over time, let me just, uh, let me skip to this one and then, and then we'll go to our discussion groups. And I mean, we have a little break. Um, you know, we often wonder why I think Paul's greatest statement on human equality, uh, the one that is, you know, super important to many people when they try and think about the, you know, how we're supposed to live with each other comes in the middle of Galatians, this book about fighting with these Judaizers where Paul says all these really, really harsh things, but it's in the middle of that that he says this amazing statement. <clears throat> so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What Barclay makes a big deal out of this in this book is, is saying that's, that's where incongruity pays off in community is because God's grace is given without any regard to your value that you think you have in this world as, a, as your ethnicity, as being a man, as being a, a, a free person. It, since God's grace came to you without any regard for any of that, then the way that you live out that grace in community now as Christians has to reflect that by no longer evaluating one another based on the value that society would assign to that. And that seems to be a... Yeah, and that seems to be a pretty good... Because the, the, one of your key questions in theology, I think in wrestling, should always be, why is Paul so angry in Galatians? Why does he care so much? The classic kind of answer, the one I think I got as a younger Christian, is because freedom is so important as a Christian, don't let anybody tell you what to do. So freedom, you know, it's like Braveheart, just like freedom is the thing, right? So, and, that, and that's true because he uses the word freedom a lot, but maybe it doesn't, maybe, maybe it doesn't mean exactly the same thing as Americans think it does. Um, but William Wallace did it, right? So he died. So, but and the other, but the other question is what does it, and that's what the new perspective on Paul brings is, how is the, um, uh, what the Judaizers are doing going to kill the community uh, of Christians that is now gathered? What is it going to do to reintroduce other systems of value, like being a Jew and observing the law, back into a community that was formed by the gospel through the Spirit? So those are really big deals, is that Paul would go places, or even before Paul would get somewhere, somebody would show up and share the gospel. Like This is like where we should remember how weird this was, you weren't a Jew, you didn't care about God, you were an enemy, you were a pagan, you, you thought nothing about God, and then somebody somehow shares the story of Jesus with you. You have this conversion experience, you show up at a Christian meeting, and probably the way it worked back then is that you spoke in tongues or something, and you had the, the, the demonstration that the Spirit had now come and live with you without having ever done anything. You had no markers. You weren't Jewish. You, had, you, couldn't, you didn't know anything about the Bible, the Old Testament. You hadn't studied, you hadn't worked, you hadn't done anything, and now all of a sudden, you are in this community and it's been demonstrated through the spirit that you're now belong with them. That's a unbelievably radical, different way of conceiving a human community than, than had ever been tried before. And so the, there's a huge amount of like community um, implications that comes out of that. This is a, a, what, the kind of how incongruity and non-circularity work with each other. This is something we're thinking about. A gift can be unconditioned without being unconditional. That's how he's trying to like emphasize both. He's trying to perfect incongruity and say that that's a big part of what Paul was saying without also perfecting non-circularity. And wrestling with what that looks like, I think is a good challenge for us. Um, so, discussion questions. Um, I'm gonna send these via WhatsApp to our group uh, so that all of you who are in that will have them. So just like, discussion questions for me are always just a way to start the conversation. If you don't have it on hand,